Welcome everyone to a small tutorial series that I'll be doing on World of Waves 3, Ironclads to Missile Cruisers. This game is a naval war game, Grognard's Dream. It has a lot of depth, but because of that I think it's also beneficial to maybe preview the game a little bit through the eyes of a person who's pretty experienced with it. For those of you who are just experiencing the series for the first time with its release on Steam, let's kind of handhold a little bit in this one. It'll be moving a lot slower than my uh, YouTube AAR series where I'm just playing the game directly. So I'll talk a little bit more about the details. You can choose a, a start time. This has definitely an effect. I think a lot of people will prefer to choose the 1890s or the 1900s. I certainly recommend either of these options for your first game. 1890s, from my limited experience at least, plays very similarly, so we won't be missing too much in terms of tutorial content if we start in one versus the other. I'm going to start in 1900 because it'll have uh, an extra feature that I'd like to showcase here. Uh, first decision you have is whether or not you want to pick a big nation like Great Britain, a um, very powerful but not too micromanaging nation like the USA. Uh, you could pick Germany. They're a little more difficult. I mean, in 1890s, they're a little more difficult. In 1900s, they're a little bit better. But if you want like a, a nice, simple early game, I think the US is the best tutorial nation to play as. So that's the one we'll go ahead and pick here. Uh, you don't need to worry about, by the way, all the other things, especially in the 1900s. You don't have to worry about the dock size being too small or anything like that. It's definitely something we'll want to build up. But this game does model dock size, meaning that your ship, the, the ship size you're able to build, is limited by you know the industrial capabilities of your shipyards, which is very cool. Um, name here, whatever you want to put. We'll put Tortuga. And fleet size. I always play on super large. For your very first game, maybe just to keep things a little bit more uh, manageable, let's just choose larger. I think large, larger, either of these is a good option. If you want to be extra conservative, go ahead and choose large. I'll choose larger for this because I think it won't be that bad. Um, there's an option here. So there's additional options in this 1900 start versus the 1890s, which you may notice if you've only seen my other playthrough. Historical resources changes the game. Um, if we cancel out, we can go back and I think that they'll show here a game naval budget, but also, yeah, they don't show the historical naval budget. In general, the historical naval budget more greatly skews the, the values. So um, Great Britain has the highest budget in both versions, but the second place, which might be France or Germany, I don't know, um, they have either, like, let's say if, if Great Britain has 40,000, they might only have like 15,000 in second place versus maybe like 25 or 30,000 on the game mode. So historical will skew things a little bit more and it probably, you know, you can rest your cursor on the pop-ups. Research rate, we don't really need to worry about this right now, but it is exactly what you think. It slows down the new technology as it, and basically slows down the game. Um, tech variation, don't need to worry about this too much, but basically it adds a little bit of replayability to the game. We won't worry about it for now. Harsher Peace Deals does what it says. At the end of any of your wars, you'll get points based on if you won, or if you're losing, the AI will get points to take some, some territories from you. Um, this is just magnifying the number of points that you get for a particular victory. Um, we'll leave it off for now, it doesn't really matter. AI Advantage basically turns on hard mode, the AI will get more money than you do. Aircraft Development, some people, not a huge fan of aircraft in the game, they prefer to stick with battleships. This allows you to do that, we'll leave it off. And this is a big option which is not available in the 1890s one, which is manually building your legacy fleet. We'll turn this on because it'll give us an option to show what I think is very important, um, one of the more difficult things to understand about the game, which is ship design. So we'll go ahead and do this. This looks fine to me, except for I didn't change my name again. We'll play as the US in this uh, existing start. So, good. Let's take a look at the game interface. It does look a lot like an Excel spreadsheet, but that's fine, the game is, um, I mean, it's very popular for a good reason. It just models everything so well, and it's very addictive. So, you know, if you, basically, if you can get by, behind the, uh, beyond the interface, there's a great game under this. We're just gonna see an overview of all the, the money stuff, basically, down here. Um, this is our dock size, which will be the limit of the size of the ships we can design. It's probably not a bad idea to pump some money into increasing your dock size. Especially because now the shipyard capacity is uh, something new modeled in Rule of Ways 3. And this means that the total tonnage that you're building 
cannot exceed this number. So if my dock size is 14,000, I can get away with building, you know, like five ships of this max size, or I can get away with building, you know, like 70 1,000 ton ships. Anyway, so as you increase your dock size, which is your max capacity, it will scale up your total shipyard capacity as well, which means that the dock size is actually a little bit more important than it was previously. Um, this is just going to give basically your the outline of the budget. So we're currently positive 8,000. That's because we have no ships and we have plenty of budget. And we also have some funds to build them. Uh, over in the top right, we have the tensions. This is uh, going to move up and down kind of randomly. It can be influenced by your decisions. And ultimately, when you cross this black line up top around tensions of 13, that's when you'll end up going to war. You can see we're at three and four, two. So tensions are pretty low at the game start. Let's design a ship. And this is the ship designer. This is where I think it's actually the most compelling part of the game, designing your own ships. We're in 1900s. I don't know what that means to you if you already have like a very good vision of what a 1900s ship looks like, if we're talking about battleships at least. And they're known as, at this point, they're not dreadnoughts. This will go back to a pre-dreadnought, which obviously is a little bit forward-looking. We already know what dreadnoughts are going to be. But before the dreadnoughts, there were, they were just battleships. And these battleships typically had two main guns of a very large caliber, but they also had a lot of nearly as large um, ships, or, or sorry, turrets of slightly lower calibers. So even this, having a caliber seven inch gun for secondaries might be a little bit low. So let's try to get like an eight inch gun for our secondaries. And we're you can see that we have 12, which means six per side. And that will give us, although I don't know if it's modeling that here, there we go. So we have six eight inch gun turrets lining the sides next to our two 12 inch gun turrets. Now note that our dock size is limited to 14,000, but if we wanted, and this was the reason why this is modeled because it was common practice back in the day, uh, you could have Great Britain build your ships for you. I mean, just think about um, the start of World War I when I think Turkey had some ships in uh, that were being constructed and the Royal Navy, I mean, Great Britain just decided, hey, you know what, we're confiscating those, I'm sorry. We're going to take them because we need them for the war. So that is a possibility that you can have tensions rising with the person who's building your, your ship and they will confiscate them. That is in this game. So I think, I don't know what the tension level is, but maybe it's above six. You're not even allowed to build at above tension level six at other um, docks. And then uh, if you were to suddenly go to war, you don't get your ships. Okay, so speed around this time, 16 knots. I think that, that makes sense. It'll be a bit slow, but we can maybe bump it up to 17. I don't mind, I mean, as the US, we don't have, I probably should have showed the map off a little bit first, that, you know, we have, what are our obligations as the United States? Well, we're gonna want to defend uh, mostly just the East Coast. The, um, the a real possibility, this is actually after the, the Spanish-American War, which you can fight if you play in the 1890s start, how exciting. But basically there's a, a tonnage on foreign stations and this is the, the key point. Um, we have a zero foreign tonnage station here, zero there. And we have zero there. So where is this 16,000 needed? Okay, so we need 6,000 tons of ships will have to be deployed in the Central Pacific. We need 4,000 tons. And doing the math, that means we'll probably need 6,000 tons here, which is the case. So there is a um, tonnage on foreign stations, which means that your colonial institutions, whatever, they demand some kind of protection. So we'll move ships over there and basically provide them protection with some gunboats. Okay, going back to the ship design. So uh, we, if we do short range, what that means is when you go to war, any short range ships are stuck, will not move from the sea zone that they're in. So if you have a battleship, which we will, of short range in North American East Coast, it will not be able to move over to the Caribbean if we wanted to during war. It'll only be able to move that way prior to war. So you kind of have like, they become like static uh, members. But I think that's okay in the very beginning. We'll want them to be more mobile as the game goes on, but uh, we're so limited. I mean, 14,000 tons we're gonna see is, is not a whole lot. Um, a common belt number for battleships of this era would probably be around 10. By the way, belt is only in the critical areas, protecting like the engine, the magazines, stuff like that. So when you think of belt, don't think of it as the entire side of the ship. It's really only a small amount. They've also split um, belt into several categories here. 
We have belt extended, which is the, um, well, it's the continuation of the belt <laughs> up to cover some other critical, well, not critical, but some other important areas further up the, um, further up the hole. And then we have uh, upper belt, which is above the water line. So these are both things we can choose to increase the production of. I think that having these at least at four would be nice. Um, higher, obviously higher would be better, but this is maybe just enough to protect against smaller arms fire. So the 10-inch belt is what we're hoping will protect against similar shells, like 12-inch guns. Um, if you want to know what penetrates what, you can always click on the gun data up here on the main guns, and you can see that right now our 10-inch armor is going to protect against our own 12-inch guns at all ranges. So at some point, you know, when you're very close in, you're going to be mostly hitting the belt. At you know, at some point, you're going to be you're going to end up hitting the deck. And the penetration, because this is a vertical, you know, vertical speed is what becomes important for penetrating the deck. The further away you are, the more arc you're going to do for your guns, and therefore the more chance you're going to penetrate the deck. But, you know, as we get further along, these um, guns don't have very long range for 12-inch guns. We'll see this range expand to like, you know, 30,000 yards eventually. Uh, but right now, at only 11,000 yards, they can only penetrate one inch of deck armor. Uh, another thing to note about the deck armor, though, is that there is fragmentation of shells. They hit your ship and they explode and they splinter. And those splinters, the game has modeled that, that there's a chance for armor to be penetrated from splinters up until two inches of, of armor. So two inches of armor means splinters will no longer penetrate, but anything below that, 1.5 will have some, maybe small penetration percentage chance, and one will have a higher one, 0.5 will have a pretty high chance of the splinters penetrating. And then if you don't have any armor at all, then you will, you know, splinters will do damage to this particular component if, they, uh, if they're deemed to have blown up near it. Okay. So, wow, uh, ship design, it's got, there's so many moving parts. Conning tower, there's two parts to your bridge. The conning tower, which is the armored area that the commander could retreat inside, inside the bridge, or the bridge itself. And there's um, two hits you can get in the game. Basically, when a bridge, quote unquote bridge hit is, is um, rolled in the game, it then rolls, I think, a 50% chance to either hit the conning tower or the bridge itself. If it hits a bridge, your conning tower doesn't matter, obviously, and it, it does a terrible amount of damage. But if it hits the conning tower, then your conning tower armor comes into play. So if you want to minimize the chance that your ship is going to become very combat ineffective, then you want some conning tower armor. And it's not too expensive, you can see, to up armor this or down armor it. Don't get too much back. Um, let's do the same thing for like a turret. You can see that like I moved twice and this goes up by 120. I moved the conning tower up twice, which is one inch, and it goes up by like 15. So, you know, I mean... Things scale kind of according to their impact, which is nice. <laughs> so you can kind of get an idea of how impactful uh, the conning tower is. Well, it's just a small part of the ship. That's why it doesn't weigh that much. But it is also higher up on the ship. So there is kind of a disproportionate increase in weight of the whole ship for uh, armoring things which are above the waterline. So that's, um. let's see, maybe I should just go through all these. Freeboard, you're going to take more damage or have less control in stormy weather or in choppy seas if you choose low freeboard. So situations where low freeboard might be desirable, if you are Italy or Austria-Hungary and playing in the Mediterranean and you expect that the weather might be a little bit more calm, then you could maybe get away with using the, the freeboard. I don't know, I guess, I don't know how the conditions are in the Baltic. I mean, I don't really know how they are in real life anyway, but I also don't know how they are modeled in this game. If maybe you could get away with low freeboard if you're playing as Russia, and then just stack in a lot of your fleet in the Baltic. That makes sense to me, like, kind of naively, but um, I generally stay away from low freeboard. You can, I, I think the only situation where I've used it is, is as Italy or Austria-Hungary. But basically, you can make your own decision on what to do. And you, yeah, it says ships with low freeboard lose more speed in bad weather and are more sensitive to flooding. Perfect. Um, short range, I, I guess I already explained this, short range ships are stuck in the sea zone at war. Uh, medium range ships can go anywhere. Long range ships means that they are able to leave um, places where they don't have enough resupply points. So you can see that there's something called base capacity used and available. In our home waters, this is going to be very high, 1650. And this basically amounts to something, the number of points you see there 
somehow translates to the amount of the amount of supply that those areas can give to ships. And well, we don't have any ships down, but once we put some ships down, we'll be able to see what it translates to. But so long range ships can go. Um, it's not that if you're in an area without supply, you immediately just die, you capsize, you sink, whatever. Um, no, it's um, you'll start taking um, morale damage and you'll have a little star by your name in the ship thing, uh, which indicates to you that this, this group is out of supply and it needs to be moved back. Now, the long range ships take longer for that to happen. So we can see, in fact, primarily the radar and trade protection abilities of the ship. Yeah, so if you want to be, if you want to do raiding in a, a sea zone, the longer range will be beneficial. Uh, obviously, it just allows you to move into an enemy territory for longer time. So if we were playing as the US, which we are, and we want to do some raiding over in Japan in a war with Japan. Well, we don't have any sea capacity here, but obviously if we put, we know that a lot of the game's traffic, and just like in real life, a lot of trade traffic would happen in Japan. So that's what that's all about. You know, you could make some long range raiders and then send them over to you know, um, Japan and you'd be able to score a lot of uh, convoy points uh, during your war. Okay, so then we have engine priority. This basically just, if we want reliability, the engine will be heavier, but less likely to break down. So we're at 1686, if I click this, we we'll go up. Well, down, I guess, but 1800. And if I go to this, it was 1600. If we go to speed, it should be underneath that. And it's 1584. I typically leave this on normal. Um, the best thing for engine priority is if you're making destroyers. Speed for an engine priority makes sense because you're not as concerned about a battleship, I mean, a destroyer breaking down. Um, they're a little bit more disposable and it's kind of a, almost more expected that they're really pushing their engines. But you might choose engine pr priority for reliable. I don't know, you might want to do it even on like a raider or something that would, if it breaks down, it's really in trouble. But I typically leave this on normal for my main battle line. All right, we went through the armor, um, secondary turrets, se secondary guns, same kind of thing. I prefer for them not to be damaged by splinters, and the minimum for that is two. So that's a good minimum to set. Because this is uh, a pre-dreadnought, we're getting back to the actual ship itself, and we have eight inch caliber guns. I think that those are deserving of a little bit more armor. So we'll go up to four inch guns. And you can see that this ship, by the way, is completely unbuildable, <laughs> completely impossible to build. We just, anytime you want, you can check, um, click the check mark to see how your ship's doing. This one is not legal because we are just massively overweight. So we know that this is not possible, but you know, maybe there's ways we can get around this by decreasing. So this is at 1900 over, we go down, we got to only 1400 over, we go down again, we're only at 1100 over. Now I think 11 inch guns, we can get away with that. Maybe what it means is we just have to cut this down to only two, only two eight inch guns per side. Uh, maybe we need to reduce the belt a little bit more. Maybe we do, oh, we're at long range. Well, that, that explains everything. That's exactly the reason why nothing is working. <laughs> okay, and maybe we'll lower this. So I, we're, we don't like to lower the belt, but we're definitely not gonna lower it below two. Uh, we'll keep it like this. It's probably, I think that's where it started. I just have this tendency to lower my conning tower armor, but let's not do that. Let's not play the Tortuga way. Let's just be very general about our um, our, dis our thing here. The Colonial Service, basically there's a four tonnage requirement, which I already showcased. And um, ships with the Colonial thing, I think they get an additional 25%. I can't believe. I'm blanking on the actual tonnage, but if you have, let's say, 6,000 requirement, you could fill that with six 1,000 ton ships. Or you might be able to fill that with five 1,000 ton ships if they were colonial service. So it adds a, you know, an effect to their colonial weight. Um, so that it's good, you can get colonial service like cruisers and then just park those on foreign station, which um, they'll be a little bit less expensive than parking the actual amount of tonnage you would need. Otherwise, I think this ship looks pretty good. Don't see anything glaring. Um, the weapons we already talked about, we can add, oh, we, this is perfect. We have a little bit of tonnage remaining. I think that this is not enough rounds per gun. Um, a good rule of thumb is probably around 100 for your main guns and around 150 for your secondaries. In this case, our secondaries as a dreadnought, um, basically there's a rate of fire to all of the guns and eight inch guns are gonna fire a little bit slower. So I'm probably okay with this being like 140. Um, with 11 inch guns, can we get that up to 12? Where it's possible we can get, it up, get that up to 12. Let's. Yeah, you know what, let's lower this down to four inch guns, get this up to 12, maybe lower this down even to three inch guns. 
I'd rather not do that actually. So we have currently six four inch guns per side, four eight inch guns per side, and then we have our two, two main guns. Let's try to figure out another way to get around that. Um, let's do it by going down to short range. Of course, that, that was my plan from the very beginning. And then I can maybe even upgrade this again. No, not it. what we can get, which is gonna be a little bit weird. You have to imagine that there's a single turret gun right here, which is not being displayed, but it's there. We just, we think about it. In fact, I want these in casemates. So that's gonna probably cost a little bit more, but now it makes sense. We can auto place this and you can see one, two, three, four, five, no, where? One, two, three, four, five. You know, two of them are not covered by this upper shelf, which this is what they're modeling. But this, um, we can see two of the eight inch guns are here and they're in their casemates. And that's, that's actually, that's beautiful. I'll just take that down to three. Eh, we don't really need to, but I think I've explained everything. This is a, a good enough design for us, even though it's at 90 weight remaining, we'll probably just get rid of that by adding a little bit more ammunition. Maybe I'll make this uh, 180 so we don't quickly run out of that. And you can see that just like that, we're up to basically no weight remaining. Oh, we can upgrade the con tower a little bit. There we go, 8.5, we're down to two weight remaining. We'll save this and we'll call that done. Um, the, the game, just as the same way as the check mark, it will give us a little pop-up when we save and finish with any notes. This one has short range, which means that it won't be able to move during battle, but that's okay. Now, because this is the ship design, I'm the, the legacy shipbuilding part of it, we're just gonna make a whole bunch of these, maybe just five of them. And now you can see that these are in North American East Coast. We don't wanna move any of these over, whoops, to anywhere else, but we can go over and check. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, each of these is only about six points each. I made five, right? So these are only six points each. You can see that actually the United States has really good foreign station capacity. Um, but okay, we're still missing actual cruisers. Let's design a cruiser very quickly. In fact, we can really use the auto generate, which is a, a great way for you to get an idea about what kind of ships are good to design. I'm gonna change this to normal because our ships are gonna be in the Pacific and they probably don't want low freeboard. Um, I don't think we need a deck extended on this thing, so I'm gonna actually remove that. Lower this conning tower a little bit. Okay, we have a little bit of space remaining. Maybe we can't, now yeah, so that deck extended is pretty expensive. I'd rather get the turret top up to two inches. Secondary guns, we're gonna take away the tertiaries on this. Well, you know what, we have the weight for it. Let's just leave it. I, I kinda wanna leave this ship just the way it is so we can speed along. Um, I guess the one way we can get rid of our weight remaining is by just dropping this down. Okay, so it, it dropped it down to negative three, which we can get back probably by doing this. Okay, there we go. So we're now positive and I think six inch guns with 170 rounds plus is, is plenty. So good, we have this, it's gonna give us a note that because these turrets are less than eight, uh, nine inches, they will suffer a 10% rate of fire penalty. Um, we'll go ahead and live with that, but if you wanted to, you could redesign it to try to make it nine inch guns instead. And we'll get about five of those. We don't have the ships to build that, we don't have the funds to build that. Okay, so we might have over, <laughs> We might not have, uh, I, I'm playing on the super large type budget and this is not the super large, but anyways, let's just demonstrate at least moving a ship to foreign station. No, 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 not like that. Active fleet, but let's just literally move the ship. So you move it by right clicking, and hitting move. That's one way. You can also go to the map. Uh, I'll show that in a second. But anyways, our destination for this, which it's going to instant, instantly transport to, is gonna be the South East Asia, good. Because that's where we have the Philippines. After our war with uh, Spain, we take over the Philippines. And now you can see that, where was it exactly? Southeast Asia no longer has a, uh, an exclamation mark saying that it doesn't have enough foreign station tonnage because it does. And we can do this similarly with, um, I mean, we should have made these colonial things. So we'll do a move ship here and take this one to the Central Pacific. And then we also want the Northern Pacific, but let me demonstrate the other way of moving that. And these ships, by the way, because this is um, like the pre-game phase, they are instantly moving there, but in, when the game starts, those will actually move over one turn at a time per sea zone. Um, for the last one, you can go ahead and drag something like this um, from, it's a from this area where I dragged from, and a two is to the place I let go of my cursor. And showing that we don't have any ships in this area, which is, I'm not sure why that's showing that. Maybe it's because of the, exactly because of this pre-building phase, but you can use that normally. We'll go back and just move it the same way, which is the way I normally move it anyway. 
Okay, that's that. Northern Pacific. There we go. Okay, so that's basically the start of the game. I mean, obviously, oh, we have 15,000. We'll probably want to design a destroyer, light cruisers and destroyers. Let's just see what they build for us. This looks you know, good enough. Try to build a single one of them. And let's also build a single destroyer just to showcase that. No, not that destroyer. And it's good enough. Destroyers are okay. This one's actually overweight, so it's not good enough. Um, we can make our destroyer short range as well, which is going to give us the tonnage that we need. They have two guns. They should have some turret torpedoes, which I didn't really showcase the torpedoes here. Um, typically, so you can see that there's one, two, three, four. I don't know if you can see that. Let me zoom in a little bit more. You can see that uh, there's the two three inch guns, and then we have two port and starboard swivel mounts center. And then there's the one in the V position and one in the Q position. This is Q, this is V. So that those are just further back. And that gives us a, a three torpedo broadside, which is not bad for a 1900s destroyer. This is, uh, this looks good. So we'll save that. There's heavy crowding, which uh, means there's too many things along the center line. This destroyer is very light, right? It's only 400 tons. So, you know, having four items along this means that things are pretty tight and they give us a rate of fire penalty to kind of like um, punish that. Uh, we also have cramped accommodations, which I'm glad that this happened because I didn't I didn't mention this. Cramped accommodations means that the crew quarters are very small and it'll lead to unrest or it might actually lead to fleet morale now in this game if you are outside of home waters. But if you're not outside of home waters, it won't have an effect. So this kind of allows you to build like a, I don't know, like coastal battleships with like short range, low speed and cramped accommodations. It's kind of like a nice little thing you can do to save, because all of this saves weight. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do another episode, by the way, to show like 1930s, 1940s, so we can get into like carriers and missiles and all that. That'll be the next episode. But I'm assuming that if you're starting the game in 1890 or 1900s, this tutorial video should be really covering the, the very beginning stuff. So I just forgot to design that. That was a mistake. Did I, did I save it? It would be saved. It was not. <laughs> well, we can redesign it. It's fine. It should design basically the same thing. We can kind of see what, what they did with their second version. They also made it a little bit overweight. We can just get rid of that short. They put on only two torpedoes this time. It still, excuse me, it still has the crowding, but why don't we delete the Q and then add instead of the Q, we can add a, you know, maybe um, a GH. I missed, I, I got that wrong. <laughs> Instead of the G, I need the I. There we go. I, I like it balanced. So now we are only two tons overweight. We can get, we can probably make work of that by lowering the gun ammo a little bit. Okay, uh, you know, it turns out that three inch shells don't weigh that much. This is bad. I would not normally do this. In fact, I think we can leave this overweight. It'll be okay. You can design ships which are overweight, and like Russia is kind of notorious for having done that. Um, their 1900 ships were uh, considered to be over tonnage. Um, there's no, it's a penalty for the ship. It may sink a little bit more quickly. Um, it may, you know, just have some problems. But yeah, we'll go ahead and just try to get away with that. And we'll build at least one of these. In fact, we might as well build the rest of our money. Since we have 13,000, let's just build 12 of these. Great. So now we're not going to lose very much money. We can hit continue. And uh, there we go. We're into the game itself. Now, um, in the very beginning, one of the things you're going to want to do... Oh, uh, yeah, we could actually construct ships now as well. So um, the game allows you to start with, like, ships half built. What I'd really like to do is get some more light cruisers. We don't have the funds. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that's right. So we want to get as many as we can. We only have 93 funds. That's really all we can do. Those are all the ships that we're going to have under construction. Why is it saying that we don't have tonnage on foreign stations? I think that'll go away as soon as we advance one turn. There it is. Okay, good. So it, it, it now recognizes that we have put my Rochester, which are effectively my colonial cruisers, on foreign stations. But everything else is just hanging out on the East Coast. We're advancing a turn. Okay, I, I didn't show the research yet. Um, now, research is all relative, which means that I think that as they say here, maybe they don't. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, research is relative. 
so this will not slow research. It is intended as a shortcut to those who prefer low as a baseline. So whatever you're doing here, you have a fixed number of points, let's say 100 research points, and we have what, like 12 categories? I don't know exactly what, but... So basically you have eight points given to everything. If I was to instead turn up high on naval guns, and I think naval guns is a good thing to prioritize. Now maybe this is getting nine points and everything else is getting like 7.5, you know, something like that. The math doesn't really check out, but you get the idea. So this is just where you want to, like what are the things you want to pressure on as secretary of the Navy? Where do you want research to progress a little bit more quickly? Where do you want to prioritize? Now the game's research system is really cool the way it's pretty realistic. You don't actually control what, what research you're going to get. You have to let the civilians figure it out. So that's what's going to happen. I may prioritize something on high and I may get the thing I didn't want. Anyway, um, we can in machinery, this is all that we can double click on any tech and see what we've already researched in that category. So I guess in light forces and torpedo warfare, we have researched at some point destroyers. Hey, and not only destroyers, but we can get them up to 400 tons. So that's something we've done and we've seen that because yeah, we're, we're able to build destroyers. Um, if we click on the ships under construction tab, we can see that we did pick two light cruisers to be under construction and they're at roughly half. So a normal ship, if we go to the build thing, you can see the number of cost. Yeah, build time, sorry. There it is, right in front of my face. So destroyers can take only eight months to build. Light cruisers take 20. Battleships like 30, okay, 28 right now. And then um, the armored cruisers, and actually I, I call these light cruisers, but they are protected cruisers at this point and there's no such thing as a light cruiser. It's more of a post-World War I type concept. But yeah, so the armored cruisers, these uh, just take a little bit more time than our, our, our protected cruisers. Because it's, it's very, very similar. Um, with our money, what other things we might want to do? You can, um, if you so choose, you might want to put some fortifications. You can go ahead and click on any territory. It shows you the value that it is. So the money that you have is mostly the total yearly budget 90, 95% of this is just based on your nation, but an, uh, there is an additional amount that you can earn from the territory you actually control. So during war, you will be able to go to war and choose to invade places. And if you do that, then you will, you can acquire territory and that will have a small benefit to your budget. And you can see that the value, the relative value, whatever this means here is listed. So Maine has a value of eight. You can't lose the home territory of these two. I can't think you can lose this one either. Yeah, this is a home area, so it has no value because you can't lose it. Don't think you can lose this one either. But we could lose the Eastern Aleutians, which only has a value of one. And the, you can see the base capacity of 10. How did we get the base capacity of 60 in this area? Well, it made up. it's made up of 50 from Alaska and 10 from the Eastern Aleutians. How do we have a sea zone of 85 here? Well, I can guess that it's not from, not mostly from Midway, but five from here and then yeah, 80 from here, which gives us a total of 85. So we have a really good, already a naval base, uh, substantial one at Pearl Harbor. The Philippines gives us base capacity of 100. You can see the value of that is five, so it's actually less than Maine, but five is a pretty big colonial holding. Most of these are either only gonna be like five or two yeah, five, five. So Vietnam has a lot of uh, areas which are high value. Here's one that's two, Kuang Chao Wan. Uh, Hong Kong is probably a five. But you know, you can have something like the Bismarck Archipelago. It's only worth two. The Terawa here, the Marshall Islands, only worth one. But you can actually conquer those and then the budget, it does impact your budget. A new, another new concept I wanna quickly go through is the division editor. Um, now we have the ability to group some of our ships into, into like divisions. So let's say I want to make a new battle division. I can choose to add ships to that. And then let's say I want my, I mean, I, I built all these, so they're North Dakota class. I'm going to put three in there, which means that these three, when they appear, they should appear together. You can also see that there is an officer mechanic. I probably won't cover that in this tutorial, but there is a whole officer thing, which you can view here. They will be assigned to ships. They have some abilities. It's a nice added layer of detail that didn't exist in the previous games. But basically I think we're ready to go. We can build more ships when we have money. We have plenty of money. So right now, if you were playing this seriously, which I'm just trying to tutorialize, but if you wanted to, you'd be building a lot of ships. Let's say you'd wanna, yeah, you can kind of mimic, if we go over to the Almanac here, you can kind of mimic what other people are doing. So we can see that we have five battleships. 
Great Britain has 11. We're, we're not really going to try to match their budget. We're more on par with like Germany, a Russia, an Italy even. So we have five battleships. They have seven and five. So it looks like okay there. But armored cruisers, we have three. They have four and six. We might want some more of those. And okay, yeah, we can see where we're really deficient is in light cruisers or our protected cruisers. Um, Germany has 10. France has seven. We have one. So let's probably work on building some more of those. And since we have the money to do it, just go ahead and build five more of those. And I don't think balance is balancing out. Notice that, um, or note that if you save up too much funds, the Navy will reallocate them to other things. So I think it's about half your yearly budget is what you can safely feel you can keep. But if you don't spend the money and it keeps going up beyond half of your yearly budget, there's a chance it'll be confiscated, just so you know. But otherwise, we're just going to play this long, and now we get the events. This is what allows us to have some agency on how the game develops. Otherwise, most of the politics is just abstracted, and we just see random fluctuations and tensions. But Spain is sounding us out about an alliance. The president thinks this can make it possible to save on defense expenditures. What is your response? Well, we got the Secretary of the Navy. We have a very pro-military viewpoint. If we say this is an excellent idea, we can have an alliance with Spain. Spain is probably the least powerful nation out of all the ones that are modeled here. So we really don't care about an alliance with them. And on top of that, it would lead to a decrease in budget. So what I could say is we might want to say we will be stronger alone, unencumbered by alliances that might heighten tensions. But that actually leads to tensions raising itself because we're, we're taking kind of a more hawkish viewpoint. And you can see that Spain wasn't particularly happy that we denied their request so that tensions went up with them. And this is how you influence the game. And here we go. A revolution in South American country has left some of our nationals stranded. What do we do? If we send a huge fleet, people are going to be like, um, yeah, that, that could go badly. Maybe this leads to a bad event where some kind of near war conflict. And then, yeah, world tensions will just rise. But because of all that, we'll have more budget. People will have to just, uh, government's like, okay, we need to give the Navy more budget because we have a potential crisis on our hands. International squadron, we can imagine this is not going to have as big of an impact. It's more of a coordinated effort, probably has less, less of a benefit on budget. And then we can do diplomatic means. Well, look at we're the Navy, so we're going to force things as much as we can. And tensions kind of go up accordingly. So you can kind of get the, the the way the game progresses at peace is very just click the turn, click the turn. When we have enough budget, which, you know, we have 1500, we can go ahead and design a new ship. Let's say we wanted another armored cruiser. Just go ahead and over here. They want to do the Denver, which is six inch guns, tons of six inch guns all over the place. And then some five inch guns. Sounds good to me. We'll just save this design and go. Um, and then, okay, when you first design it and you're not in the pre-game phase, it does take a little bit of time for them to actually put that design together. So we'll wait just two more months. Aha, a hawkish government wants to raise arms exp expenditures. This is fantastic. It'll raise a lot of tensions. And uh, we can consider the other options too. Austria-Hungary has stolen technology from us. We can get upset, which will raise tensions. Or we can lose prestige by not raising tensions. Well, we will just raise tensions because we want to go to war. And you can see the <laughs> effects that, we're had, that are being had from our decisions. Um, now we could rework the design once it's finished, but I'm gonna say that the Denver, whatever it was, is good enough. I'm gonna go to the build screen where I can order up a few more. And you know what? We don't have enough capacity for that. Well, I have four more months before I have an, an, you know, a, an upgrade in dock size. So let me just build one less and get away with that. Oh wow, those Denvers were eight thousand. My goodness, those were those are quite large armor uh, protected cruisers. So we can't get away with five, but we can get away with sixty-two thousand worth of tons. It's uh, it, actually funny. It doesn't. It would be nice, I think, if it told us the amount of tonnage. Yeah, we can't lay that down either. Oh, we've already laid down up to the limit. I see. So we can't put down any more because we only have 79,000, 7,900 and we need 8,000 for the Denver. That's fine. Okay. And we are quite negative on monthly balance. So it's probably good that we did, we kind of lay back on the ship construction for a little bit. Now let me pause and jump to any other thing I think I need to showcase before probably something about war. Just I'd pop in and say, hey, you know, we're getting some research breakthroughs. We got one in light forces and torpedo warfare. We can now have destroyers of up to 500 tons. 
Otherwise, things are progressing. You can see that, oh, we also got some torpedo technology. So the first of those two technologies was an increase to something we can design. But the second one, I think the torpedo technology led to a general benefit. Um, otherwise, uh, our ships are getting towards the point where they're almost built. But uh, we really ran our budget down, our funds down to only 10,000 and our monthly balance is uh, about neutral. I just keep pressing the button, keep going through new turns. And this is another like general benefit. So this will, um, a new, any new designs will have less expensive tonnage wise machinery, which means you can use that tonnage for more weapons or, you know, better armor or something like that. But it's not, um, that's, that's something which is only going to affect newly designed ships or ships where you rebuild the machinery. But just keep poking through here. Yeah, and here's a, a officer, a new officer-related event, but I don't think it's a big, uh, you know, big deal. Uh, pre <laughs> prestige and morale suffers, so our fleet morale has dropped. It's going to lead to, I think, lower crew quality overall. All right, we unlocked a pretty important tech, submarines. Submarines do exist in this game, and you can build them. We now have the ability to build coastal submarines. These are pretty abstracted in the game, but let's go ahead and build some just to say that we have some and, you know, to demonstrate that we can build them. And uh, then there, you're going to, it's going to give you some fun options. When you go to war, you can choose um, to like go full unrestricted trade disruption, which might piss off a lot of other nations, but it'll give you a lot of victory points. Or you can do conservative things like only have the fleet uh, only have the submarines protect the fleet, kind of like the Japanese doctrine um, in World War II. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, that that's an interesting thing. I, submarines are fun to play with in the game. Uh, they don't usually appear, you, you don't actually directly control them the same way you do ships in the tactical battle, but they can still appear in the tactical battles. Well, at this point in the game, it hasn't been that long, only a year and a half in, We've started to build up some serious tensions. Uh, there's one uh, mechanic that I didn't explain here because I forgot to use it myself, which is the mobilization state. All these ships are currently in the active fleet. Usually when you go to peacetime after war, you want to set things to reserve. The main motivation for this is it's going to save quite a lot of money. You can see that our monthly balance was 5 and now it's 742. The downside of it is it will lead to lower crew quality because you're not training your troops as much and all that. So, uh, you know, there's a definitely a trade-off. And as you get closer to war, you'll definitely want to mobilize all ships back from reserve and mothball to active fleet to get them ready for the, uh, the pending combat. So that's just one other thing I would mention is that you can save a little bit of money. We probably should have done this right from the get-go. Just put all of our ships on reserve. It won't apply to ships that are on foreign stations. Those have to maintain active fleet duty, but all the ones that are in home port you can get a little bit of cost, saving, cost savings by putting them onto reserve. Okay, here's another mechanic that's new in World of Waves 3, unless you were using my AI Wars mod, but there's um, now modeling of tensions between all the different um, nations. So it just showed us that there are tensions that are very high between Japan and Russia. And tensions of being very high is 10, which I think is ours are 11 actually. I guess I can see here. Yeah, oh no, our tensions with France are also 10. So you can see that as high as our tensions are with France are the same kind of level of tensions with, and how not, How about that? How It's random, but it's historically accurate that Japan and Russia are about to go to war in early 1900s. What do you know? Now, there was no such occasion between the US and France, as far as I'm aware, but and in fact, we're kind of pushing up against a war with Russia as well, which is cool. Because it might get, it might end up the situation that Japan is at war with Russia at the same time we are in independent wars. But here we go. We're finally going to be at war, and that's going to allow me to, indicate, you know, here we go. We're officially at war, and that's going to lead to combat. Um, so war management is a little bit different from the perspective. Okay, yeah, this whole new thing. Here's the submarine warfare policy I was talking about: fleet support, prize rules, unrestricted. I think that the best way of playing this is, especially if you're new to the game, auto move submarines, um, auto move ASW ships. I didn't even realize, I've not actually never used this option before. We are going to want to put some ships on trade protection. In fact, this, it's only now that I realize that you should learn from the error of my ways. We really should have gotten some Corvettes, which can be really nice, cheap ways of developing, um, uh, what is it called, anti-submarine warfare. You need some ASW ships. 
Now the good news is when you go to war and only when you are at war, you can develop, you can like basically pull in the same way I think Great Britain did this for the during World War II. You can pull in um, civilian ships and just basically commandeer them for military coastal patrol type stuff. So we're gonna do that and you can, that's modeled in the game by being able to build very light, like 300, 400 ton Corvettes. You can build these extremely quickly for very cheap. The downside is they will disappear when war is over. So let's just quickly, I'm just gonna, you know, this is mostly about um, submarine warfare. So what we really want is, I think that everything's actually fine here. We, we basically just need this thing to have ASW capability and it will it will have that just by its very existence. Yeah, I mean, even though this is tons of weight remaining, we don't really care. I mean, I guess we can add a, a rear gun. I'm not even sure if we can. Okay, we can. <laughs> so just make sure we can get away with that. Um, it already has mine sweeping gear. We don't have any, so you can see the ASW value of this is just one, it's not great. It would probably go up to, yeah. So if we take away the mine sweeping gear, which I think we'll want to do in this case, just so we can have better submarine protection, um, the ASW value is go goes up. This is divided by, it's cut by 50% when you do mine sweeping gear. So if it's at four here, like 4.0, it'll go down to 2.0 when you add mine sweeping gear. But we might actually want mine sweeping gear. Um, we can build two different types of, of Corvettes even. And this was at 300, you can see that we can still make it 300. Okay, save and finish. And if I can quickly go over to the build thing for this, you can see this only takes four months to build, basically to refit into military service. And it's very cheap to do so. So it's only four months, the build time is basically negligible, negligible, and the maintenance cost is really all we're gonna have to deal with. Again, note that this ship will go away as soon as um, the war is, is over. So we'll build those, but in the meantime, we're gonna need these Bane bridges to act as some kind of trade protection. And you can see that they uh, require us to have at least five ships to protect our trade routes. We'll try to give them a little bit more than that. We'll give them six. We can end the turn. And that's probably when we may end up seeing here after all this. Okay, there's a trade summary. Basically, nobody sank anything. Is there any battles? No, so there were no battles this time. And battle is actually what I wanna get into in the next tutorial video. So for now, thanks for watching this. And until the second tutorial, stay safe and take care.